location check. Reset. Select level. Hey, good morning, Northeast, and welcome back to really what is the conclusion of our series, Relationship Reset. And this week, as we wrap up our series, we're going to talk about love. And the reality is the Beatles once famously said, all you need is love. And yet, if all we need is love, why is it that our relationships are often so hard? It, everyone starts with love at the altar, but if all you need is love, why is it that so many end up with irreconcilable differences? Why is it then in our relationships that so many times hard things overwhelm love? I believe the issue is not our need for love, but more a mature understanding of what it actually means to love, as God defines love. The truth is God has a great deal to say to us about what it means to walk in the way of love. And who better to listen to on the subject than God? After all, God authored love. In fact, the scriptures would say he isn't just the author of love. First John 4 would tell us God is love. So who better to define what it looks like for us than the one who himself personifies it? The scriptures say that the greatest of all gifts is love. It is the first of the fruit of the Spirit. It is the greatest of all virtues. And God, I believe, then wants to guide us in it. If you're here today feeling stuck in a loveless relationship, I believe God has something to say about that. And if you're listening today feeling, well, I'm not even in a relationship or our relationship is fine. We're great. We've nailed love. Then, a hey, good for you. This message, just watch it next week, right? When after whatever happens, inevitably happens, and you're not feeling loving anymore. And the reality is what we're going to do is we look in this passage, we're going to realize that what Paul is speaking to is not just a marital issue, it's actually a church issue. And he speaks to a church about issues that they're having where they're not responding in love. And so even if you're not in a relationship, just think for a moment about what it looks like to love those that are hard to love in your neighborhood, in your schools, or even right here in your church is I believe God has something to say to us about how to walk in the way of Jesus, how to walk in the way of love. And what we're going to see today is that love is not about how we feel. Love is about our obedience and what we're willing to do in spite of how we feel. So turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, it's two-thirds of the way through your Bibles. It's after the New Testament books of Acts and Romans. If you have a physical Bible, meet me there. We're going to read this chapter. I want you to have your eyes on it with me as we study it together. If you have uh, your favorite Bible app, pull it up on that. If you're watching from home, we'll put it on the screens to help you follow along. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul writes in what we kind of officially dub like the, the chapter of love. And he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. How many of you heard this passage read at a wedding? Right? Read at a, how many of you had this passage read at your wedding? 
Well, here's the reality. The reality is that Paul didn't write this for a wedding. In fact, contextually, when we look at this, this is not a passage that he intended would be read right before the priest walked up and started, you know, his thing, like, love to love. <laughs> okay, so we have a few Princess Bride fans, right? See, so often when we read this passage, we just attribute it to that. Because when we think of love, we only think of it in a romantic fashion. And so we've taken this passage and we've stamped it and said, this is about marriage. This is about couples. This is what it, meant, what it means to be loving to your spouse. And yet the truth of the matter is in context, this passage wasn't written about marriage at all. It was actually written to a church, Corinth. And this church is deeply divided. Corinth is in the midst of deep division. There are all kinds of problems in the church, causing all kinds of relational tensions between members of the church. There was immorality in the church. There was infighting. There was posturing. There was pride. There were rich people not wanting to have anything to do with the, the poorer people. Corinth was an absolute mess. And then in chapters 12 through 14... Paul's writing about the gifts of the Spirit because in the midst of their mess, there were some members of the church holding on to some gifts claiming to be greater than other members because their gifts were greater than those gifts. And so in the midst of this posturing, in the midst of pride, Paul speaks into what it looks like to be loving. If you really want to know what it means to be spiritual and to walk in the way of Jesus... There's something you need to do, not just something you need to claim or have. So Paul speaks into this mess. If you claim to be spiritual, it's going to have a lot more to do with loving conduct than it is just spiritual gifts. And notice how he speaks then about love. See, we speak about love as emotion. Paul speaks about it entirely in the context of action. Look again, just verses 1 through 3. If I speak an action in the tongues of men, but have not love, noisy gong, clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and knowledge. If I have faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Paul here is talking about a church that's holding up one gift over another, posturing themselves, saying, if you have this gift, you're greater, you're more spiritual than that gift and that person with that gift. But then here he's talking about these, these three sections. He's talking about speaking with the gifts, operating with the gifts, or serving with the gifts. So the, those three things in those first three verses. If you speak with the gifts but have not love, doesn't count. Clanging gong. And who wants to listen to that all day? If you operate with the gifts, even with great faith, but have not love, you are nothing. And if you serve with the gifts, even laying your life down, but don't have love, you've gained nothing. In all of this operation of the gifts, he's saying, it has to be from speech, action, and service. It has to be lived out in love. And the word that he uses here is an active word, not an emotive word. The Greek word he uses for love here is agapao. Or agape, as we often transliterate it. Agapao. It's not eros. In the Greek eros was the romantic love. Or it's not phileia, in which we get Philadelphia, which is a brotherly love, right? Or relational love, familial love. No, agape is a principled love. It is love because of what it does, not because of how it feels. Agape is self-sacrificing, not self-gratifying. It acts in the good of the other in spite of how you feel, not because of how you feel. So you and I either give love or withhold love based on what someone else has done towards us or acted towards us or how we feel in relationship with them. But what Paul is defining here are actions in spite of, not because of. And this was a real kicker for the church in Corinth because they'd spent so much time being so caught up on their own spirituality when Paul says, yeah, but you're not being loving. And to be caught up in your spirituality without love is to have nothing. To speak, to act, to serve, but not have love is to have nothing. And so it leads to this question then, well, well then Paul, what is love? Like how do we, where do we root our spirituality? What does it look like to be loving? He says, okay, well, let me, let me then define love for you. And he defines what love looks like, verses 4 through 8. He says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. 
meaning envy someone else's gift or boast in your own. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. Notice again, as Paul is writing and defining what these are, he's describing not emotions. He's describing what? Actions. Love, he says, is patient. When things are hard, when things are slow, when the other person isn't changing as fast as you want them to or hope that they would, love is patient. Love waits. Love is kind when it wants to be harsh because we're tired of having this conversation over and over and over again. Love doesn't get upset and storm off. Love is tender. Love is kind. It's gracious. Love doesn't envy what the other has or boast about what you have. Love isn't arrogant or rude, pushy or bullish, because those are attributes that show that I am thinking more of myself than I am of you. And then verse 5, love does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. And that word resentful in particular, what Paul speaks of resentful here is this Greek word logizomai. Logizomai literally means to count or to bear in mind, to keep in mind. It's an accounting term. It was a term used of those in the marketplace who, who kept a, a ledger. And in the marketplace, as people would buy or sell goods, they would track for themselves, since there were no electronic sales, since they didn't swipe your card and Clover would email you your receipt, they would sit and they would write in their ledger who had purchased what for how much and whether there was any outstanding debts to be paid. This ledger tracked what everyone had paid and what everyone owed as a way of holding them to account. Paul's saying, love doesn't keep a ledger. There's, there's no ledger in this relationship of love. You're not looking for payback. Instead, love, he says, bears all things, believes all things. Love writes off the debt. I mean, th these are tough things, right? Paul's speaking into tough things, tough relational things. And the reason they're tough is because he's describing action, not emotion. He is talking about choices, not about passions. And this is tough for us because in a Western context, we define love so much by emotion. Uh, love for so much is being, for so many of us, is being struck by Cupid's arrow, right? It happens to us. It happens when we meet the right person. It happens when they walked in the room. You had me at hello. So, so we wait for love to happen. We wait to fall into love. We wait to get struck by love. We wait for love at first sight. We treat love as something passive when Paul and the language of the verbs here is all consistently active. Love is not something you wait for that happens to you. Love is something active that you go out and do. And in a very real way, then, Paul is saying, love is not an emotion that, you, that we, you and I, should be passionately exper or passively experiencing. Love is an action that we must daily choose. It's not something that we passively experience. Love is an action that we daily choose. Love is kind. I have to choose to be that. Love is patient. <sighs> really? Yes. Love is not irritable. Love bears with all things. It's not something that's just passively going to strike you, or that we wait for it to kick in before we begin to act it out. No, Paul is saying to a church that's already divided, to a church that is already messy, to people that are already holding and harboring bitterness in spirit, he's saying, hey, act in this way. Because the claim to have the greater gifts but not do these things, that's not the way of Jesus. In a very real way, they wanted to define their spirituality by the gifts that they had been given. And Paul is telling them, hey, those gifts you've been given, they matter, but not if there's not love. 
You must apply this to your life. We want to consider ourselves followers of Jesus by having certain things. Paul says, no, you must also consider your follower, yourself a follower of Jesus if you're doing these things, if you're living in the way of love. It's not about earning anything, earning salvation. It's about showing that Christ has changed your life by walking in the way of Jesus Christ. And, and this is proved out in his final words on love. Verse 8, 13, love never ends, he says. It's for prophecies, they'll pass away. For tongues, they'll cease. For knowledge, it will pass away. We know in part, prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Why is he talking about these things passing away? Again, the problem with them is they're comparing all, all of these gifts they're comparing themselves to each other in the church as to who's the most spiritual and godly. And what Paul ultimately then says is, hey, stop comparing against that because all of those things are going to end, but love never will. One day you'll get to heaven and you'll be standing before Jesus face to face and there'll be no need for those spiritual gifts, but we will still love because we will know love perfectly. God is love. Love will still exist in heaven. These spiritual gifts, he said, they will cease to be. Everything that we're holding on to and arguing here in, the, in Corinth is imperfect and temporary, but love will never end. It's greater than the gifts. Verse 13, it's greater than all the virtues, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Again, he's speaking to the spiritual people who want to hold on to spiritual gifts and spiritual activities of worship and different things in the church, but they aren't acting in love. And in a very real way, he's saying, hey, you can't claim to be spiritual and have these spiritual things in you while treating someone unspiritually. It just doesn't work. And the reason that's so important, the reason that we bring this up at the close of the series is because I believe so many of us have fallen into this very same trap. That we think about the gifts that we've been given and we go through the spiritual motions and I've come to church and I've sung the songs and I've prayed the prayers and yet we'll continue to harbor in our hearts things that Christ has told us love doesn't harbor. See, the flesh is so tricky, is it not? The, the reason that I trip and fall in applying this in my life is because my flesh helps me remember so much of what people have done to me. It's weird, but my flesh doesn't remember any of the things that are really important and necessary, right? Like, what's your name again? Like, when is our anniversary? When's his birthday? And what's his name? Like, the little one that runs through the living room every now and then? Like, we can't remember any of those things. What did you ask me to do again? I can't remember what we decided on that. I know we talked about it for hours, but I don't remember. I'm sorry. Like, we can't remember any of the important things, but I can go back and I can tell you every single word of what someone said when they hurt me. And I not only remember the words, I remember the inflection. I remember what time of day it was. I can remember what I was wearing. God knows our hearts, and Paul knows our heart. And how often we hold on to the wrong things, all the while claiming to know and follow Jesus, claiming the spiritual gifts, but harboring in our hearts thoughts or emotions towards others that he says, hey, love isn't just how you feel. Love is what you're willing to do in spite of how you feel. The reason that we have to unpack this and the reason that this matters is, hey, because God says it matters. When God defines love, understand he defines it not just in context, he defines it supra-contextually, supra-culturally. This definition goes beyond just this moment in Corinth. It defines what love looks like from Genesis to Revelation in every instance because God bears this out in practice himself towards us. One great commentator on this book said that you could so easily replace in this passage the instances of the word love, especially verses four through eight, the instances of the word love and just replace it with Jesus or replace it with, with God or the Father. 
Jesus is patient and kind, or God is patient and kind. God does not envy or boast. God is not arrogant or rude. It's a supercultural definition. And Paul's seeking to apply it to our spirituality. And the reason it matters is because so many of us hold on to the hurts instead of letting go of the ledger. So many of us will go through the spiritual motions. Say, I'm good with God. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. I sing those songs. But I refuse to make up with that person. So many of us will do studies and pin Bible verses as Facebook posts, but avoid certain individuals because of the difference of opinion we have or how they have acted towards us in the past. We will claim to be spiritual and go through these spiritual motions while holding on to hurts and keeping a record of wrong. I understand Paul, again, is saying, man, love is is greater. It calls us to greater things. It's not that those things are lesser. The scriptures absolutely call us to soak in the scriptures, to read the scriptures, to memorize them. The scriptures absolutely call us to prayer and to worship and to coming together as often as we can. It's not less than that, Paul is saying, but it's so much more. That we walk in the way of love because this is how Jesus operated with us. Though there was a ledger the size of earth itself with all of our sins listed out, Jesus himself and his kindness and his patience went to the cross. And, And the picture of Jesus in the final moments praying to God with tears in the garden of Gethsemane, asking the Father what? If there be any other way, let this cup pass. Why would you ask that? Because in that moment, Jesus wasn't feeling like dying a painful death. And though he did not have the feels in that moment, Jesus acted and operated in obedience to the Father. Because love is obedience in motion. See, biblical theology of love is that it's not emotion, it is obedience in motion. Obedience to your Father, obedience to the example of Jesus Christ, a willingness to lay down your life time and time again. It is obedience in motion. So what do we do with this? Two takeaways that I would challenge you to as we wrap up this series. Really two prayers. Prayers that I repeat constantly myself and prayers I'll encourage you to as well. The first is this. Lord, Help me to do the loving thing. Help me to do the loving thing. So often in this context of love, I will pray that God would help me to love people. And what I've discovered is often when I pray, Lord, help me to love this person. It's a difficult person, a difficult relationship. There's, there's an issue and help me to love them. What I'm really praying is, God, would you help me to feel loving towards them? Would you help me to feel compassionate? Would you help me to see something in them and, and just have this overwhelming sense of compassion? Many times that feeling doesn't come, and I need to change how I pray. Lord, if the feeling never comes, help me still to do the loving thing. Because it's what Jesus did for me. For the joy set before him, he took the cross. Lord, help me to consider it joy to obey you, and joy to walk this love out, even though it doesn't feel it right now. God, help me to do the loving thing. And then the second prayer, I mean, consistently pray to him is, Lord, help me to lay down my ledger. I I carry within my soul something that the flesh has put there that the spirit wants to remove. And it's a ledger. It's a ledger of the things that have been said and the things that have been done and the things that I and my flesh want to hold on to and the spirit wants to purge me of that. The Spirit wants to take an eraser to that and teach me to forgive as Christ has forgiven me, as God through Christ has forgiven me. And I have to pray consistently, Lord, would you help me lay down my ledger? This hit me square between the eyes this week because as I was literally studying this passage this week, at home trying to get a few hours away from distractions in the office, I was 
distracted by something that my wife said, and I thought she was talking to me, and here I'm being interrupted doing God's work, and I did not respond in the 1 Corinthians 13, 4 way, where it says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not irritable, and I'll just confess to you, as my church family, I can be irritable. In the midst of that moment, I I wanted to write in my ledger all the reasons why I was right, all the reasons why I needed to stand my ground on this, all the reasons why why this was something that I should be holding on to, all the while trying to study a passage that's teaching me that love is willing to sacrifice, that love lays it down. And in the midst of this, I have to teach, Lord, help me to do the loving thing when I don't feel loving. Lord, help me to lay down the ledger, though I want to take it up. Because the scriptures remind me that God was so very willing to lay the ledger he had against me on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. That Jesus would willingly go to the cross and forgive all of my sin not holding it up in that moment, but instead forgiving it. When in that moment, coming to him, I was completely unaware of exactly how deep my sin went. And by God's grace, he didn't wait for me to get it all. He forgave me in spite of the fact that I still have so much to learn. So what does it look like for us to walk in the way of love? It looks like this. Father, would you teach me to do And would you teach me to lay it down? So would you just pray with me as we close? Can I just ask you in this moment, would you take up a private conversation with the Lord? The question is, why do I list these applications as prayers? Because the reality is, you cannot do it on your own, in your own strength. They are prayers because we need God's help to do that which we cannot in our own strength and our own flesh accomplish. And that is the gospel. You cannot save yourself. You cannot do good enough. You need a power that you do not have, an ability you do not possess. And yet Jesus promises for those who will come to him, confess their sin, he will not only forgive their sin, but he will give them a helper, the Holy Spirit, to strengthen us, to empower us. That we would be able to do that which he has called us to do. And so understand as we close, this is not about you trying to do better in your life. This is about you surrendering more of your life to Jesus Christ and asking for his help and his strength to live out the way of Jesus and the way of love. So would you just take a moment and do an audit of your relationships? Would you take a moment and invite the Spirit to speak to you and ask him, Father, is there any area of my life, any relationship where I am where I'm holding on to a ledger that I need to lay down. Father, we come to you broken and unable. We come to you in weakness, not in strength. We come to you as people who have been hurt and people who, because of that hurt, hurt others. And we first and foremost, we ask your forgiveness. Father, forgive us for our sin against you, for our sin, our bitterness, our resentment towards others. Lord, change us from the inside out. And Father, would you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, do exactly what you promise. Would you strengthen us in the midst of weakness and give us the ability, Father, to do that which we cannot to love when we are feeling hurt. Father, to trust you with the resolution when we don't feel like there's a resolution in sight. Father, to lay down, Lord, the things that we're holding on to. We're asking for your strength. We cannot do it on our own. 
Father, would you by your spirit change us, transform us, renew our minds, Father, we ask that we would think rightly about these relationships that you have given to us and that we would walk and live rightly in them for your glory, God. And we trust that it will also be for our good. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or even imagine, according, Paul says, according to his power that is at work in you, go now. Make disciples and love well. We'll see you next week.